delve into the chilling saga of John George Hay, infamously known as the Acid Bath Murderer. Discover how his facade of charm and elegance masked a series of cold-blooded crimes that shocked post-war Britain. Before you is a murderer of irresistible charm. Handsome, impressive, eloquent, and damn self-confident, which seemed to be his greatest weakness. The fate of the criminal I will tell you about is uniquely tied to several other serial killers. Listen. John George Hay was born on July 24, 1909, in Stamford, Lincolnshire. He was the first and only child of John Robert Hay and his wife, Emily Nee Hansen. Emily was 40 when she became pregnant. She went through the blessed state exemplarily until the last trimester. However, during the last three months, she experienced great stress and anxiety. Her husband lost his job as a foreman in a mine. The couple fell into financial difficulties for some time. The Hayes had to borrow money to survive, which was a great disgrace to them. Hay Senior found a new position, and the family eventually settled in the village of Outwood near Wakefield. There, John spent the first 24 years of his life with his parents. John grew up in a very religious family belonging to the conservative Protestant sect of the Plymouth Brethren. Members of the sect lived simply and piously and maintained discipline in the service of the Christian congregation. Interestingly, another serial killer, Dr. John Bodkin Adams, 10 years older than John Hay, who likely led to the deaths of 163 of his patients, also belonged to the Plymouth Brethren for his entire long life. Hay was an only child and a truly lonely child. His parents forbade him games and playing with peers and from engaging in sports. They built a three-metre wall around their property to separate themselves from the outside world full of evil and moral decay. The boy's greatest joy was animals. He had a dog and several rabbits. He also fed the neighbours' dogs, giving his own food away. Animals were more important to him than people. He was a polite, obedient and disciplined boy. When he misbehaved, his mother would hit the back of his hand with the bristles of a hairbrush, sometimes drawing blood. Supposedly, the boy licked his bleeding hand with pleasure. John would talk about this in adulthood. He also recalled the religious-based nightmares that tormented him in childhood. Considering how skillfully he lied and manipulated people, one cannot help but ask whether he indeed had such experiences. Little John's only entertainment was classical music and biblical stories. The boy had musical talent. He learned to play the piano excellently at home. He loved listening to live classical music concerts. He received a scholarship to the independent Queen Elizabeth Grammar School for Boys in Wakefield. In the Anglican Cathedral, also in Wakefield, he became a chorister. It's worth noting that at that time, the choir consisted only of boys and men. It wasn't until 1992 that the Cathedral Choir accepted women and girls. It's odd that John participated in the Anglican Rite, since it was contrary to the views of the sect his parents belonged to. In church, young Hay would stare at the images of the bleeding Jesus, which supposedly further stimulated his imagination and increased his thirst for blood. He took a completely different direction after finishing school, which he left at the age of 17. Like his father, he became interested in engineering. He completed an apprenticeship at a car company, which is common among people with antisocial personality disorder. He soon left his newly acquired trade and jumped from company to company. He worked in insurance and advertising, always looking for the easiest way of life. At the age of 21, John first revealed his thieving tendencies. He was fired for stealing money from the cash register. He was not deterred by his new passion. He forged vehicle documents in the next company. He also started a dry cleaning business with a partner. It was going well. Unfortunately, his business partner died in a motorcycle accident and the firm collapsed. On July 6th, 1934, 25-year-old John left his parents' sect and married Beatrice Betty Hamer, a lively and beautiful girl two years his junior. Unfortunately, this story will not have a happy ending at this stage. The couple lived with John's parents, although they were not favorable to the union. However, Betty left her husband. Moreover, John ended up in prison that same year for forgeries, 
and was sentenced to 15 months. Betty gave birth to a daughter during this time and, without consulting her partner, gave her up for adoption. In one fell swoop, John lost his wife, child, and parents. The Hayes, pious and God-fearing as they were, did not want a black sheep in the family. They completely cut off from their sinful son. Lonely, John moved to London in 1936. Now remember well the person at whom he took employment. This man will return in my story in quite tragic circumstances. John became the chauffeur of a 25-year-old William McSwan, who made a fortune in gaming salons and then invested money in various industries. William liked his new employee and trusted him. However, John remained himself, a swindler from the provinces who aspired to the world of the rich, as he deemed better. He resigned from his position of his own accord. They parted on good terms. He preferred to open his own business, not necessarily an honest one. He pretended to be a legal advisor named William Cato Adamson, who had offices at Strand, Guildford Street and Hastings. He dealt with selling counterfeit shares. He created a legend for them. They were supposed to come from the estates of his deceased clients. Of course, he sold them at lower than market prices. However, he was caught. He was not as brilliant as he thought and would think for the following years. He felt better, more cunning, smarter than others. As you can guess, such thinking simply does not work. He made a spelling mistake in the name of the town on the alleged company paper. This is how his lie was discovered, and the whole intricately woven financial intrigue fell apart like a house of cards. He was arrested and sentenced to four years in prison for fraud. World War II broke out, and Hay was released on parole. The sentences in no way worked as a deterrent for him. He continued to steal and cheat, repeatedly ending up behind bars for fraud. Until now, Hay had committed petty crimes. He became outstanding in his craft, but still imperfect. Witnesses stood in the way of his full happiness. Even during his imprisonment, he began to wonder whether it would be better if he literally eliminated the people who could potentially accuse him. He even found a role model in the criminal world. Georges Alexandre Sarret, a lawyer from Marseille, removed the bodies of his victims using sulfuric acid. He organized complex insurance frauds. Eventually, one of his partners in crime and bed betrayed him. He was guillotined in 1934 for the double murder of his lover and his business partner. John, not for the first time, chose a criminal model who was caught. It never occurred to him to model himself after those elusive ones. Hay now practiced not only his mimicry in front of the mirror, like a chameleon. He also began to experiment on dead mice. He dissolved their bodies in acid, which took him about 30 minutes on average. Killing is easy. Getting rid of the body is the real art. John believed he had developed the perfect plan, the perfect crime plan. After another stint in prison in 1943, he took a job as an accountant at Mr. Stevens' engineering firm. He also lived with him for some time. He met his two daughters. One of them, the young Barbara, plunged into the circle. Both loved music, and that drew them together. The young girl naively believed that Hay would marry her someday. As of yet, he hadn't revealed to her that he had not divorced his first and only wife. Don't think he had settled down. He had not given up on his increasingly dark plans. Fate would have it that by accident he stumbled upon the good at Kensington High Street, where he met his former employer, whom he had been a chauffeur for, William McSwan. Unfortunately for them, McSwan introduced the likeable former employee to his parents, 68-year-old Donald and 62-year-old Dorothy McSwan. Hay looked on the family harmony and the prosperous family business with envy and spite. McSwan, also an only child, was involved in collecting rents from London properties. Hay decided not to test on mice anymore. He found his first victim. On September 9, 1944, it was William McSwan. Hay was responsible for his disappearance. As later revealed, Hay, with his lies, led McSwan to the basement of the apartment at 79 Leopold Road, which John had rented three days earlier. 
Hay beat the man to death with a club. He later told the police that William's agony lasted five minutes. He was terrified of what he had done, but he had no remorse. He went to sleep. The next morning, he implemented the second part of the plan. He stripped the body of clothes, a watch, and other valuable items. Folded in half, he pushed it into a drum filled with concentrated sulfuric acid. At this first crime, he did not protect himself in any way. He had no gas mask. Every now and then, he ran out of the room to catch a breath of fresh air. For two days, the acid digested Max McSwan's body. Eventually, the murderer poured the contents of the barrel down the drain in the basement. The body dissolved into a stinking sludge which flowed with the sewage into the river. The murderer planned to also get rid of William's parents. He traveled to Edinburgh, from where he wrote a letter to the McSwans, pretending to be their son. He reported that he would stay in Scotland, hiding from military conscription, and would sustain himself with real estate trading. Indeed, William had filed documents in 1939 stating that due to his beliefs, he refused military service. In 1941, however, he received a deferred conscription notice for six months. He feared he couldn't escape the obligation. Thus, he frequently moved around, as he wasn't measured for service. Hay used this fact to cover up his crime. He began to empty the victim's accounts. Gradually, month by month, he withdrew various amounts. Moreover, he maintained relations with William's parents, somewhat taking his place. As the war was drawing to a close and the McSwan's son did not return, they wanted to know what had happened to him. On July 2nd, 1945, just as he had done previously with William, Hay lured them to a basement on Gloucester Road. He promised they would meet their son, who had unexpectedly returned from Scotland. He killed Donald and Dorothy McSwan one after the other with blows to the head. The police suspected that he had used an axe, but he maintained that he had beaten them to death with a club. He disposed of the bodies in the same manner as before. This time, however, he was fully prepared. He had a rubber apron, gloves, boots, and a face mask. These items have survived to this day. They can be seen in the Crime Museum at Scotland Yard. After the murders, Hay took the victims' pension checks. Through subsequent frauds, he sold their property for about £8,000. Now he could afford to live in the elegant Onslow Court Hotel in Kensington, in room number 404. Hay had many sins to his name. He also had a dangerous addiction to gambling. By 1947, the McSwan's money had significantly dwindled. He lacked funds to maintain the lifestyle he had become accustomed to. He didn't look for honest work or investments. He looked for his next victims. The choice fell on 52-year-old Dr. Archibald Henderson and his 41-year-old wife, Rose. Hay read their advertisement in the newspaper about selling their house and presented himself as a potential buyer. He offered a decent high price, although his account was empty. The Hendersons struck up a social relationship with the courteous John. They invited him to their home for a thankless party. Hay attended and after the party stole the host's bicycle, gas mask and revolver. For several months, he deepened his acquaintance with Archibald and Rose. He listened attentively to their stories about their wealth, investments and possessions. He looked with disgust at their relationship, which was not the happiest. Hay rented a small workshop on Leopold Road in Crawley, 45 kilometres south of London. He transported the murderer's utensils, acid and barrels from Gloucester Road there. Henderson had presented himself from the beginning as an inventor. Everything was planned to the detail. On February 12, 1948, Archibald arrived with John at the workshop to see his invention. Hay simply shot him in the back of the head with the stolen revolver. He performed a similar procedure with Rose. Mrs. Henderson also died from a bullet. He threw both bodies into oil drums filled with acid and dissolved the remains. He threw out the residue on the rubbish heap behind the property. He then went to the Metropole Hotel in Brighton, where the Hendersons had stayed. He robbed them of their valuables, settled the room bill, and disappeared. To the hotel staff, he announced that the couple had gone abroad 
and he was settling their London affairs. He forged signatures and thus sold the Henderson estate, keeping only the car and the dog for himself. He wrote a long letter on behalf of Mrs. Henderson to her brother. He presented the deceased woman's clothes to his girlfriend, Barbara. When the murdered woman's brother was about to go to the police, Hay convinced him that the Hendersons had fled to South Africa because the doctor had performed an illegal abortion in London and was fleeing from legal consequences. Wealthy 69-year-old Olive Durand Deacon, a lawyer's widow, had been living in Onslow Court for six years. Hay ingratiated himself with her, presenting himself as an inventor and marketing and sales specialist for cosmetic products. Olive shared with him the idea of producing artificial nails. On February 14, 1949, she showed him several of her designs, asking if her idea could be improved and put on the market. Hay politely replied that he would consider it. He insisted he had to show her the results of his work at the factory in Leopold Road. On February 18, 1949, Mrs. Durand Deacon entered the factory, which turned out to be almost a storeroom. Hay shot her in the back of the head, robbed her of her jewellery and took her distinctive fur coat. He returned to the hotel and ate a three-day-old dinner. The next day, other guests asked him about Mrs. Durand Deacon. He explained that although he had made an appointment with the woman, she had not shown up. Two days later, Olive's concerned friend, Mrs. Constance Lane, confirmed with the widow's maid that her lady had not given any sign of life. The woman could not just disappear overnight. She had a daily routine she never deviated from. Clearly, something bad had happened. Mrs. Lane announced in the hotel that it was time to report the disappearance. Hay suggested he would drive Mrs. Lane to the Chiswick Police Station. Both of them made the report, provided a photograph, and left a description of the missing person, which was circulated to all police departments and the press. Sergeant Lambourne, the officer sent to interview the hotel staff, learned from the manager that Hay was a very suspicious individual. Moreover, he was indebted to the hotel. He mingled among the older residents and clearly sought their favour. Indeed, he was the only middle-aged male guest among the elderly ladies. The policewoman became increasingly convinced that she was on the right track to uncovering the truth. She sent an inquiry to Scotland Yard to see if John Hay had a criminal record. Within an hour, she received a response. His name kept reappearing in the criminal register for thefts, frauds, forgeries. Suddenly, the nice and helpful Mr. Hay became suspect number one. Blue-eyed, handsome, well-groomed, with refined manners, he was always impeccably dressed, always wearing gloves. As we would say today, he had obsessive compulsive disorder. He was constantly afraid of dirt, frequently washed his hands, which probably meant a need to control the situation. And it was not about getting dirty. Hay, unaware that the police were closely watching his past and present, eagerly provided reporters with information about Mrs. Durand Deacon. He believed she would return safe and sound. When he said this, not a muscle on his face twitched. Yet, Hay had just returned from the crime scene. He had emptied the barrel, went to value the stolen jewellery of the victim, and returned to the hotel. Unbeknownst to him, the police went to the infamous workshop. They entered, searched the modest premises, found barrels, acid bottles, work clothes, and other macabre tools. In the suspect's briefcase was a laundry receipt for the fur coat of Mrs. Durand Deacon. There were also documents of the Hendersons and the McSwans. That same day, Detective Albert Webb took Hay from the hotel to the police station. The atmosphere thickened around John. A jeweler, to whom he pawned the victim's jewellery, reported. He had signed with false data, but the jeweller recognised Hay. Moreover, the criminal seemed to forget that he had previously visited the same store with other valuables, introducing himself as John George Hay. All trails led to him. He was arrested. He remained calm, smoked cigarettes, read the newspaper, slept. He waited more than three hours for the interrogation. During this time, investigators gathered available information. The detective wondered how to crack the elegant suspect. 
New threads kept coming in. Hay was the last person seen with the Hendersons. Interrogated, John recounted his crimes. But before doing so, he surprised Detective Webb by asking about the chances of ending up in Broadmoor, the psychiatric hospital for insane prisoners. He was feeling out the ground. Unfortunately, he didn't get an answer. He confessed to the murders of the McSwans, the Hendersons and Durand Deacon. Furthermore, he admitted to killing three more people, a man named Max, a girl from Eastbourne, and a woman from Hammersmith. However, no traces of these murders were found. Hay believed he could maintain the version of his madness. He believed that since there were no bodies, there were no crimes. His calmness bordered on arrogance. Years ago in prison, he pondered the perfect crime and discussed it with other inmates. For him, it was clear that if there were no bodies, there were no crimes and no guilty parties. He didn't anticipate that forensic evidence could lead to conviction. To emphasize his madness, he vividly described how after murdering each of his victims, he cut their throats with a penknife and filled a cup with blood, drinking it before proceeding to dispose of the body. A few days later, after interrogation, a pile of rubble behind the workshop was examined. Forensic technicians, smeared with Vaseline and wearing gloves, sifted through the suspicious area. They found 13 kilograms of human fat tissue, part of a left foot, three gallstones, 18 bone fragments including pelvic bones, parts of the upper and lower dentures of Mrs. Durand Deacon, as well as her handbag, lipstick case, hairpin and notepad. During the trial, which lasted two days, July 18th and 19, 1949, Hay insisted he was insane. He talked about his childhood obsessions with blood, which returned to him in 1944 after a car accident. He dreamed of bleeding crucifixes ever since. Hay was blindly convinced that he was in control, that successive psychologists and psychiatrists who examined him on behalf of the court would believe him. What he called madness, was his egotistical belief that he was above the law. Many years earlier as a chemist, he had become acquainted with an employee of the Sunset Psychiatric Hospital and inquired about various mental illnesses. He thought that since he could impersonate an engineer, lawyer, doctor, inventor with equal grace and persuasion, he could be a convincing madman. He had no money to hire a defender so he was sponsored by the News of the World newspaper in exchange for the exclusive rights to his story. Sir David Maxwell Fife, his defender and participant in the Nuremberg trials, found many witnesses who testified in Hay's favor, speaking of his paranoia that plagued him for years. The jury deliberated for 15 minutes and found him guilty. The judge sentenced John to death by hanging. While waiting for execution, Hay finished writing his biography promised to the newspaper. He also wrote letters to his beloved and parents, assuring Barbara that he never intended to kill her and that she would have been safe with him. Hay agreed to have a cast made of his face for the wax museum. He also left his clothes, stipulating that they be kept in immaculate condition, ironed and clean. On Wednesday, August 10th, 1949, Hay went to meet the executioner at Wandsworth Prison in London. On the way to the gallows, he was offered a glass of brandy, which he gladly accepted, asking for a large serving. The execution was carried out by England's chief executioner, Albert Pierpoint. Thus ended the life of John George Hay at 40 years old. Murderer, thief and fraudster, or vampire? Who knows? Perhaps he didn't think at all, or maybe he modelled himself after another infamous murderer, Peter Curtin, the vampire of Dusseldorf, executed in 1931. For several years, Hay's wax figure was exhibited in the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussaud's Wax Museum. His story and character appeared in many films, songs and theatre plays. John Hay was inhumanly unscrupulous and humanly mistaken, considering himself a genius of crime. He forgot the biblical teachings from childhood, forgot about the sin of pride. Beware of such people. Yes, they eventually get caught and unmasked, but the evil they do cannot be undone. 
finally, a few interesting facts. Prosecutor Sir Hartley Shawcross also took part in the trial of Dr. Bodkin Adams, which I mentioned at the beginning. Hayes' defender, also a participant in the Nuremberg trials, infamously made his mark in English legal history. In 1951, as Minister of the Interior, he began a campaign against homosexuals, leading a campaign aimed at, I quote, ridding England of this male vice, this plague. Through increased arrests of male homosexuals, surveillance and entrapment using agents, provocateurs, telephone wiretaps and falsified documents, Wandsworth Prison continued to use flogging with the cat -o nine tails for several years after Hay's death. The gallows on which Hay was hanged were used until 1961, although they were maintained and preserved until 1993. A tea room for prison guards was later built in its place.